then. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Hask. I'm director of the Cornwall Library. Thank you for coming to this Earth Day panel regarding local efforts to combat climate change. Um, as Shari mentioned, everyone will be muted and um, you'll use the chat feature. We're going to have questions and answers at the end, so please put your questions into the chat. And we are recording this, so if you miss it or you have to leave or if you have a friend who, you know, sorry they missed it, um, it will be on our website within a few days. It takes a bit of time to, to uh, edit it and get it onto the website. Um, so um, Shari Goodfriend is going to be our moderator today, so I will pass things over to Shari. Thank you. Thanks so much, Margaret. So everyone, thank you so much for coming today. This is really exciting. Um, I'm just going to do a tiny little plug for my friends at the Climate Museum who have this campaign called Hashtag Beyond Lies, which is about the fossil fuel industry. Um, I just wanted to explain why I'm wearing a baseball hat in the middle of the day. And I wanted to welcome our amazing panelists. Thank you so much, the three of you, for being here. This is really terrific. Um, we're going to start out with Jeremy Brecker, um, who, as many of you know, is a lifelong Cornwall resident, and he is the author of more than a dozen books on labor and social movements, including three books on climate change, which are fascinating. You should absolutely read them because they are downloadable as PDFs, and he highly en encourages people to share them and or print them if they need to, although we try not to print too much so we don't waste paper, right? Anyway, you can read them online. Um, he's the co-founder of the Labor Network for Sustainability and board member of the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs. And before I hand it over to Jeremy, I'm just gonna introduce our other panelists. Um, so I know many of you, all of you know Gordon, who is our first selectman and has been since 1991. He is also active, very active in the community, as you all know, especially with Cornwall Volunteer Fire Department. And of course, with his family, he runs the organic farm that he founded way back before anyone was thinking about organic farms in 1980. Um, and thank you, Gordon, for being here. He's going to um, inform us of a lot of cool things going on in our town that we might not know about. And last but not least, um, my childhood buddy, James Laporta, is the owner of Litchfield Hills Solar, which is um, a Cornwall-based green company, um, which installs solar and vault photovoltaic panels. And um, he um, graduated from the University of Vermont. He then went on to work at Motorola and Genrad and Hughes Aircraft Raytheon. Um, out in California. He has a degree in electrical engineering, and he worked um, at Hughes in their uh, space program as an electrical engineer. Um, and he is a consummate conservationist and outdoors person and environmentalist and all these wonderful things. Um, and he, to that effect, he has installed over 250 solar panels across Litchfield County alone. So um, he has some very interesting information to share with us. So with that, now we all know who we're treated to today. Um, I have a question to start out for Jeremy. So Jeremy, I wanna make sure you can unmute yourself and I'm gonna put the spotlight on you too. Um, okay, I think I have to ask you to unmute. So, okay, so Jeremy, a um, couple of weeks ago, um, I heard on NPR, as many of you possibly also did, that the WHO issued a news release that said that almost the entire global population, 99% of people on this planet, are breathing air that is unhealthy, that exceeds WHO air quality limits. It threatens their health. And um, that has been determined because now a record number of Six, over 6,000 cities in 117 countries are monitoring, monitoring their air quality. So um, us here in Cornwall um, mm -hmm. think, well, you know, our air feels kind of fine. Like, do we really have to worry about this? And I'm curious in your experience and from your knowledge and research, what is the situation in this region and what are some of the effects of climate change that we're dealing with and what has been sort of addressed on a governmental level? Take it away. Well, uh, I'd like to start for thank by thanking everyone who's here for coming out and sacrificing some time on this glorious day that is uh, couldn't be more perfect for Earth Day or for reminding us 
uh, what a precious, beautiful earth we have and how lucky we are to be able to live here in the midst of such a beautiful part of it. Uh, and I also to say that I'm uh, really honored to be here with Gordon and James, uh, who are people who have done and are doing so much to address the problems of climate change right here in Cornwall. And then we'll have an opportunity to learn from them what they're doing and what they think we could be doing uh, additionally. Um, I once flew across Connecticut in a tiny airplane piloted by my brother Earl Brecker uh, and we could see the haze uh, uh, that was uh, uh, hovering over the state. We could see that there was less of it here and more as you began getting into the urban areas. But uh, we also all know that there are days when we turn on uh, or look at the uh, smog reports, the pollution reports that often come with our weather reports. And we know that it's also coming to us and it's going to be coming to us more. So I think that the, uh, it's not as if we are part of the people who are uh, the 3% or whatever it may be who are not affected by uh, smog and air pollution we too are affected by smog uh, and air pollution. And to go into the broader uh, question that you raised, uh, this is not just a question of smog and air pollution as we thought of it, but the whole issue of climate change. Uh, we used to think uh, of climate change as something that was far away and long in the future. The symbol of the victims of climate change was not us and it was not a person, it was a polar bear. How far away could you have your image of who's gonna be affected by climate change? Uh, and at the same time, it was something that uh, uh, many of us believe very reasonably was a terrible threat for our grandchildren or our great grandchildren, but not something that we really need to worry about for ourselves and our own lives. And now we're finding that both of those uh, assumptions uh, were completely wrong. And we find that right here in Cornwall uh, with more intense storms, more intense hurricanes, uh, rain bombs. Uh, some of you will remember that we had a rain bomb on uh, Route 125 near Cornwall Village that just came down in one small area and wiped out a part of the road, uh, flooding, um, and at the same time, because of the irony of climate change, not only flooding, but also droughts, fires. We had the first fire, uh, forest fires that I can remember in my lifetime, and I've been in Cornwall about 72 years, uh, uh, in uh, uh, East Cornwall, lasted a whole, basically a whole winter. Uh, invasive plants, are definitely promoted by climate change. And so are disease vectors and epidemics that have so much affected our lives in the last three or so years. So the latest scientific reports uh, from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which is kind of the definitive source, had made, has made it completely clear that the cause of climate change is overwhelmingly the burning of fossil fuels. And equally clear that the, the solution is primarily the reduction in fossil fuel burning. And also that there has to be a social justice dimension in addressing these. Um, so it's very easy to despair, both from the kinds of facts uh, that Sherry uh, gave uh, from what we were experiencing directly and from the failure of our governments to address this in any adequate way. Uh, but not everyone is paralyzed by despair. And I've been doing a lot of research lately on local and state level efforts to address climate change, to reduce fossil fuel burning, uh, and to uh, 
put in place the elements that we need, the building blocks we need at a local and state level to be able to combine them and expand them when we get to power politically to move uh, a climate change agenda more fully at the federal and global levels. So let me start with an example, but not a place you would particularly expect, uh, South Windsor. Uh, South Windsor has decided, developed a uh, town power plan that they expect in five years will produce more than 80% of the town's power with renewable or carbon-free energy. They're already producing 28% of the town's uh, electrical uh, supply from renewable and carbon-free energy. Uh, and the reason that they're able to do this uh, is because of something called virtual net metering or shared solar, in which you can take your solar collectors and put them on a roof one place and use that power uh, in other locations. So in South Windsor, what they're doing is they're putting uh, uh, solar panels in, actually in North Windsor, <laughs> in places where they can be used uh, effectively. And then they're using them for schools and uh, all the public buildings in South Windsor. And they're also using uh, uh, new models of uh, heat pumps, boilers, uh, ventilation, heating and air conditioning systems. And how did they pay for this? Uh, it's all actually ended up saving money. Uh, unfortunately, in Connecticut, this is the only example of doing this because the utility companies have opposed the use of any form of shared uh, solar in Connecticut and have prevented it from happening in any other examples besides this one and a couple of other coming pilots. But it's certainly something that we could do in Cornwall were we legally permitted to do it. Uh, I have a house that's a, not a great site for solar, but I'd be glad to pay some money to put solar on someone else's roof and use some of that electricity myself. Um, so let me give a couple other Connecticut examples. Uh, I have a friend uh, who is the president of an, uh, a transit a bus drivers union. Uh, and um, uh, he decided he was gonna campaign with his union for electric vehicle, electric buses. Uh, they went to the head of their company, their employer and said, well, we'd like to be in on the design uh, and uh, procurement of the buses we drive. And um, the guy who was a young, uh, lively guy thought, gee, this might really look good. Uh, and so they actually put the union on the procurement committee and they have uh, a, now uh, the first of a, a growing number of electric buses uh, that are, have replaced the diesel buses uh, that they were driving before which in addition to reducing greenhouse gases is also much healthier for the drivers and for the customers. Um, so uh, the, let me now take a couple of examples uh, from small towns and rural areas uh, outside Connecticut. Uh, one of my favorites is Hudson, Maine, which has a population of 1,309, uh, pretty darn close to Cornwall, I'd say. Uh, and they uh, have an energy program that was uh, the states established for towns under 4,000. They've done two lighting projects and five heat pumps at the town's fire station and senior center and the town offices uh, at saving a lot of money and um, uh, making them much uh, healthier and safer. Um, Jeremy, and, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Can you can yeah. you say what they did again? Two lighting projects, oh, did you say? Two, yes, they put in uh, low e low electric, uh, mm -hmm. uh, high efficiency lighting. Okay. In their government building. And what was the second thing you said they did? And the second thing they did was to put in heat pumps. Oh, heat. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Heat pumps, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Exchangers. 
Thanks. Uh, in the fire station and the senior center in the town offices. Great. Um, Great. And uh, uh, so, uh, and as you all know, we've done a lot, uh, uh, thanks in part to someone who's on this panel with putting solar and other energy, uh, green energy pr uh, programs into our town offices also. Um, and uh, so let me go on. Uh, I've got lots more examples I could give, but let me go on uh, to uh, Cornwall. Uh, and I know the other panelists are gonna talk about it. I had a long list of things we might consider doing in, here in Cornwall, but I'm just gonna mention uh, a couple of areas. One is energy production. We've got solar, but it, as I think we'll find out, it could be expanded greatly. We also have a potential for geothermal, which a couple of people, a few people in town have used, but also could uh, contribute to big reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions through reducing the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, this area used to use water power a lot. Uh, we had uh, water power, we had a, the weir in West Cornwall. Those rapids are the result, uh, just above the bridge, are the result of the weir, which was designed to capture water power and use it to uh, run our old timey uh, scissor factory and shear factory. Um, that's something that could be looked at again. Of course, the Housatonic has been used for hydroelectric power uh, uh, until fairly recently. Uh, and there's attempts to revive it now. <clears throat> Another piece uh, uh, with energy are potential solar gardens and solar farms, which again, uh, we are restricted from doing because of state policies that have been uh, instituted very much at the behest of uh, our um, uh, electric utilities. So that's examples of energy production and transportation would be another case. We've had uh, electric bikes are a newcomer to Cornwall uh, and we have some electric vehicles. Um, we also have a revival of uh, freight trains on a very small scale, but that could also be something uh, in the future. Things we could think about in the future are ride sharing. There used to be something called the Cornwall New York Commuter Club. Uh, which uh, basically had a list of people who were driving to New York regularly and a list of people who might be looking for job, uh, for drives, for rides, and put those two things together. Um, and um, in the age, that was before the age of the internet, it would be infinitely easier to do it today. Uh, we have the electric bikes. Perhaps we could think about uh, delivery services using electric bikes and other electric vehicles. Um, <clears throat> we, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of truck transit, a lot of stuff that comes in and goes out by truck. Uh, electrifying trucks uh, might be another important contribution. Uh, in order for people to really be able to use electric cars effectively on a wide scale, we need electric charging stations. Uh, and maybe we should also be thinking uh, public transportation, public transit is enormously more uh, uh, energy efficient than everyone driving in their private cars. Maybe we need to think about uh, 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 electric minibus service uh, as something that we could uh, uh, build into our way of doing things in Cornwall. So I could go on adding examples uh, in the list that I made, communications, buildings, waste, farming, forests, education, health, community services are all areas where we could think about doing things that would uh, cut our pollution and cut our uh, carbon footprint. <clears throat> um, so, uh, and hopefully that's something we can uh, discuss further and I'm sure other people here will have ideas. And just to conclude, uh, the Paris Agreement says that in order to um, 
uh, even have a chance of meeting the uh, uh, standards that will prevent the most severe effects of climate change, we have to move our societies to zero emissions by 2020. Uh, and uh, there's one town in Connecticut uh, that has actually established a policy of reaching zero emissions uh, by the uh, along the target timelines that the Paris Agreement says are necessary. West Haven last year adopted a climate energy plan uh, that uh, is designed to reach those targets. And there are 180 other communities around the United States that are committed to reaching 100% clean energy on the timetable laid out by the <clears throat> Paris Agreements and that the community of climate scientists has said is necessary if we were to avoid the very most severe results of climate change. So let me close with the question, what should be our goal in Cornwall and how should we start trying to get there? Thank you so much, Jeremy. I just had one question. Was the Paris Agreement by 2020 or 2030? No, the Paris Agreement is phased. So it's, and it's also different for uh, uh, the rich countries in the north of the globe and the poor countries in the south right. of the globe. Right. 50%, uh, the, the uh, uh, zero target is for 2050. Oh, 50, but, okay. Uh, that's sort of the end, that's the end game of a process that has to start immediately. Uh, if we don't start really in the next year or two uh, by not building any new fossil fuel infrastructure uh, and then starting to replace it with uh, uh, clean energy and starting to reduce uh, the amount that we need through energy efficiency, if we don't actually start in the next year or two, even those goals will be impossible to reach. That's really the conclusion of the, of the two most recent uh, IPCC reports. So basically there's zero time to get started. And instead of having it go, going up like this, to have it come down like this, there's zero time to do that. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, so, okay, we're going to shift gears and go even more locally now. And before we hear from Gordon, we are going to have his daughter, Rebecca, who's a very talented artist, do a very short presentation on some of her artwork, which is climate related. So I'm gonna reset the spotlight over to you. And there you go. Welcome, Rebecca and Gordon. And thank you so much, Rebecca, for doing this. Um, just so as a background for everyone watching, when we had our planning meeting, I saw this amazing, these amazing paintings behind Gordon. And I said, what are those and who did them? And he said, well, my daughter. And I said, well, can she please talk about them? So over Perfect. to you. Okay. okay. I will do my best to keep this brief okay, as no a problem. project um, for um, my bachelor's degree in environmental studies, I did a series of paintings on climate change. It was based off of this climate science framework by Dr. Kimberly Nicholas, um, which is like climate science in 13 words or something. And it has five different bullet points. So I did five different paintings. Um, started with it's real, it's us, we're sure, it's bad and there's hope. So I will do my best, Zoom isn't perfect, but I will do my best to show each one of these paintings that I did um, as a representation of each of those points. So the first one that I did, I don't know if you can see very well, is, oh, my camera's moving for some reason on its own. No, it's not, um, I'm not sure how to change that. So just bear with me. They're trying to be smart and find our faces but I'm trying to show a painting, so that's not really helping. Um, so anyways, there you go. So this is um, obviously the, the globe and making a show, uh, it show that it's hot. And so this is for it's um, real. And on here, I have the map of the increase in um, CO2 emissions as well, or a graph, um, as well as the change in global temperature. 
um, just to show the signs. And then quickly to its eyes, which is um, showing the source of different um, emissions. So obviously a big focus on fossil fuels, energy efficiency, um, agriculture, as well as transportation and yes. Um, and then we have, we're sure. And on this one, it was probably the hardest one to do. And so I thought of the idea of making a, all of basically a puppet held up by fossil fuel companies drowning in um, academic and firsthand sources saying that this is the consensus all on um, the academic as well as frontline communities. Um, and then it's bad is has different things like extreme weather events, um, coastal flooding, drought, uh, wildfires. Um, and then it's kind of hard to see, but then I had climate migrants as well, um, sea level rise. And so how there's a very little bit of like good land and um, climate migrants coming from these different disasters and um, that sort of um, social problem. Uh, so lastly, there is, um, there's hope. So uh, obviously you can tell that this is a lot brighter of a painting. Um, we have our renewables. We have a lot more greenery um, as a way of carbon sequestration. Um, we have our solar panels, more biking, less um, cars on the road, some commuter rails and sustainable agriculture, um, a farmer's market there too. Um, so that was what I did. And I thought it was a very interesting way and a like a succinct way to show these different points of climate science, because on one hand, it's incredibly complicated. On the other hand, that's because people have a vested interest in making it complicated when the science is clear and the consensus is there. Um, I will let my dad speak because we like to talk in this family. Um, but one thing I would like to say is I know that this is focused on Cornwall and empowering ourselves as climate activists is really important. I would just like to also mention that as we do as much as we can here in Cornwall to also have that global perspective. So something that I sort of think about is um, like, you know, uh, recycle renewable energy as well as vote, as well as, um, you know, connect and um, advocate on a political level because we need more communities like Cornwall um, and doing all they can. So a macro and a micro view is really important with an issue as complex as climate change. Thank, thank you so much, Rebecca. Those are such <laughs> powerful images. And I see everyone's clapping and like sending <laughs> messages in the chat. So thank you so, so much. One quick question. Where did you get your BA? Hamilton College. Oh, great. Okay. And um, so it's kind of yeah. fun because you can see, you will see now as my dad talks of uh, sort of how I got that influence and that interest in the environment. Yes, because definitely. I'm going to take one more second here. Uh I'm sorry to, to interrupt here. I'm just going to add myself in. Um, I wanted to mention this in the beginning, and I'm sorry I spaced because some weird technical thing happened and it threw me off. But um, I wanted to thank Susan Claw for um, coming up with this event in the first place. She's on the program committee, and she it was her idea to have an Earth Day event. And I'm so grateful to you, Susan, for coming up with this idea and coming getting the panelists to do this and getting this all going. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I know you're there. So everyone, you can applaud Susie. OK, all right, now back to Gordon. Thank you. OK, thank you. And thanks for having us on today. I just thought um, that's, that's a hard act to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, and before I was first selectman, I was actually a writer. And I have, a, I have one book to my name, and that's Renewable Energy in Northwestern Connecticut. And uh, that was published in 1981. Um, and just as a Cornwall thing, uh, it has some great illustrations. It's at the library. It has some great illustrations, which are just as relevant today as they were in 1981. Um, and basically, the uh, the book showed that we had a um, we we're using a lot of fossil fuels at that time, and we were we would be able because we live in a uh, resource-rich area to 
uh, replace those with renewable energy almost completely by the year 2000 if we decided to do it. Now, of course, we decided not to do it. And there's been, as a country, there's been repercussions that are, are still spilling itself out. Um, but just as a Cornwall thing, Mark Smont did great illustrations in the book. Uh, I was very lucky to have him. And here's, here's his, his inside front cover of, of your uh, Cornwall people giving all their treasures to the oil barons. And after we became energy in independent, then uh, the um, no. the uh, the future CCS student there is giving them uh, a nickel, and they're shocked by that. And I think um, and there's Mark and some of the uh, illustrations. Like here, he has a methane uh, digester where you see the car, uh, the cow plopping and then turning it into a gas, which then gen uh, generates power uh, to run the television. And here's Johnny. So it's a classic Cornwall energy book 40 years ago. Um, and again, uh, it's a, it's, it shows what the potential is and some things that have happened since then, like electrical vehicles, let alone electric bikes, uh, weren't on the horizon then. So it's the technology has, has improved so much. Um, and they're now, you know, big windmills in the town of Colebrook. Uh, and just uh, one thing we did learn that the hydropower plant in Falls Village, those turbines were installed in 1914 and they're still cranking out 10 megawatts of power, which is almost as much electricity as the town of Salisbury and Falls Village at the time consumed. So that shows you how much power, and again, talk about a life cycle cost, those, those turbines were made in Germany over a hundred years ago now are well paid for. Um, so again, uh, some things have happened and there has been a lot of installs um, of solar projects and we have moved uh, in a direction. But if you think of what's going on in the world, you know, right now on Earth Day 2022 with the combination of uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, that a lot of that is coming down to energy. And again, uh, by not being energy independent, uh, we, the Western Europe is being held hostage to Russian oil. So, I mean, it's almost the same thing on a much more serious level than Marx cartoons. Inside there, there's a, there's a huge political price to be paid for being not energy independent. So there's, a, there's an integration between our political crisis, our environmental crisis, and you know, what's playing on there with the, the atrocities that are happening um, daily in Ukraine. So again, thinking about our earth, it's more, you know, it's, it's not just um, environmental survival right now. We have you know, democracies at stake. And again, the, the energy, Dependency is at the heart of a lot of what's going on there um, and the need for one country to seem to take over another country for its resources, for its geopolitical things. Um, so again, the earth is very much in, you know, at a precipice, in a balance now um, that we as individuals have a huge responsibility going forward on a global level. Um, on the good side, what we have seen is um, we have seen with uh, COVID uh, and getting through all that, we did see a reduction in CO uh, emissions because people were driving less and uh, people were doing remote work. So for the first time, you could see the actual impact of how lifestyle changes individually can um, have a huge global impact because as Rebecca's um, art shows, it's us. And so how we live our lives has a lot to do cumulatively as far as whether we're beating a pandemic by getting vaccinated or whether we're able to do remote work and just think instead of having to everybody go down to the library in their cars, we all are electronically communicating and reducing our carbon footprint by doing this. Um, so there's a lot of power 
in, in our individual decision making that can have a huge collective difference. Um, as a town, again, um, we have done a lot to try to uh, help the environmental um, the environmental cause and to keep, you know, to try to keep things green. Uh, we've, you know, and I think part of culturally, uh, we, as people in Cornwall, one of the unifying trends is a lot of people like to dig in the dirt, whether it's gardening, farming, and whatever, or uh, supporting those activities, but also, you know, our frugality recycling has been enshrined by events like the rummage sale. And I, I was glad to see that picture behind Margaret at the library. Those are the, those are the founding mothers of the Women's Society, which is now the rummage, you know, sponsors the rummage sale. So, and that goes, you know, that picture is almost a hundred years old. So uh, the women, that was Women's Aid Society, there, which was done by Arlington Utzlers, and those women are making quilts for relief. So for the crisis of the day, that's what those women are doing. So again, keeping your eye on what's going on in the outside world, taking individual action, working together, 100 years old, great art by Arlington Utzler uh, in the library. Um, so again, our, our recycling thing, and we're revamping our, our transfer station, and and we have an opportunity there because we've been doing some improvements on our buildings to again uh, scale up our solar panels. And I would imagine the town would, would be doing more, quite a bit more with that. Um, James did put solar panels on our town office. Was it 10 years ago almost, I would think. Uh, so right now the town office um, does not get an electric bill. We actually generate more power than, um, than we use there. So again, and we've tried to insulate the building. Uh, we've converted from oil to natural gas, which isn't perfect, but it's less polluting. So we are working and transitioning our buildings over to cleaner heat sources. Um, and one thing we are also doing, instead of one of my messages too, is to reuse, not just in recycling, but when you think about your buildings, instead of tearing down our transfer station and building our, uh, you know, a big new fancy place, we basically recycled the building and upgraded it. The same way we've, instead of tearing down our firehouse in West Cornwall, um, we have upgraded that building to do some more energy efficiency, insulation. Um, and again, basically use keeping the frame though. And so you're not chewing up all those resources when you're redoing your buildings and, and doing a big building teardown, where in some other communities in Connecticut, 75% of their new housing is built with teardown buildings, replacing smaller houses with bigger houses. So again, we're, we're trying to reuse buildings as a huge um, environmental savings. Another big thing the town does, uh, and I think it shows um, by these two speakers, is the education process at CCS has always been strong on the, on the environment. Uh, I was taught about solar energy in 1970. So that was a while ago. And again, I think the art, combining art with environmental thing. Um, I'm also now mentoring two uh, eighth grade um, student independent projects, one on organic uh, gardening and the second one on, on bike riding. And these are the projects the kids themselves have designed. So again, the next generation is, is, is really far ahead and, and are into these things. Some of the kids are riding their bikes through uh, to school every day. So again, another thing we're looking at is capitalizing on, uh, I saw Terry Burke was there and he's been a great bike advocate. And we are now gonna be on uh, US Bike Route 7, uh, which is in the West New England Greenway, which connects New York with Montreal uh, as a bike route. So making this area more bike friendly um, and you can look at alternate um, forms of transportation. I think is really important. And, and if anybody said 10 years ago, we'd have a bike store in town, people say that wasn't possible until Bob Benson took it right before when everybody thought he was crazy. He was way ahead of the curve. And that now, you know, he's hiring people, the business is off the charts and we have a second bike store in town. So again, those are all things as far as encouraging local businesses, encouraging people to work from home, um, you know, build your community, 
and you do, and the and the social impact of having people in town that can work from home is huge. And it's again another positive thing to be able to go downstairs and turn turn on your computer without having to commute an hour to somewhere else is huge. Not just uh, for our town, but what you know? How do we get rid of the of the smog that Jeremy saw off in the plane with Earl? Um, Another thing we're looking at is encouraging another round of home composting, trying to reduce our waste that is now having to be shipped out of state. Uh, again, we're looking at trying to do more home composting because again, the solutions, if we have a government solution, a town solution at, you know, I was just talking to Ted and Will about this yesterday. If we start a program in town, we're still gonna have to ship that compost somewhere, whereas people take care of their own compost at home, um, even if they bury their, corn cobs and watermelons, it's better than taking it down the transfer station, then we have to ship it somewhere else. It's better than shipping it to a landfill, but if you keep it home, get it out of the waste stream, it's better off than, um, than what we're you know having us having to do. The other thing, getting into the farm a little bit, one thing we started this, uh, this year is doing less uh, brush burning. We in the town office hand out a lot of brush burning permits. Um, we smelt the forest fires from out west last summer up here. And we were going, we went from drought to flood conditions on the farm. At the same time, we were smelling the Western wildfires, probably for the second or third summer. We've been, you know, so the idea that, that what's going on out west with the drought can also impact our air quality here, definitely it does. Um, but also what we can do is what we've done on the farm now, if we're clearing brush, we just make a big pile in the woods and let it rot. If so we have our own little carbon sink out here in the woods. Um, and so we're not burning it, we're just letting it rot and eventually it will go down and turn into soil. Um, again, the whole agricultural impact, we could spend a lot of time talking about, but bringing it back home, one thing that is now the, the price of food is going up tremendously. Part of that is because a lot of the fertilizer that's being used to grow our food here in the U.S. and in South America, the food's grown in South America, shipped up here. The fertilizer to grow that food is shipped from Russia. So everybody is now having a short supply, of international short supply of fertilizer and some of the foodstuffs. But think about that. Not only is your food, if you're not eating local food, not only is your food being shipped from far away, the fertilizer has used to, maybe it will again, I don't know, but apparently it did come across the ocean on a boat to then grow in South America, then to come here. So by having local food, you're cutting out all that impact of transporting your fertilizer and your food and nothing drives me crazy, but to go to a store and find out they have their local organic or their organic food this time of year is coming in from out of the country. So again, shipping food organic or not, out from a totally different part of the world uh, is contributing to our, um, our problems when we do have solutions of trying to encourage local agriculture. And I could go on and on about that. And I can tell you about how manure based compost, again, is replacing natural gas fertilized. Chemical fertilizers is made from natural gas, which now we have to export to Europe because if you're going to cut off the Russian pipeline, they're going to, their economy is going to tank. And that's, we apparently liquefy the natural gas and send it over there. Big scheme, very tricky. Uh, but if we produce our own fertilizers on the farm and then grow local food with it, as opposed to using chemical fertilizer, that will be yet less use of these resources, which are now causing international problems. So again, Michael, Pollen, when he talked for the library, said that national health is determined by what you eat. Well, certainly our national security is also intertwined with having a sustainable energy future, with having a, but also we could have that under control, but we pollute the environment the same way. And think of the environmental impact of having a major war is on this. Not only is the international cooperation now gone down the tank, but the impact of all those explosions, the fires, everything else is, is catastrophic. So again, ha there are things we can do locally and as a town and as a community uh, that we can harness our, you know, instead of feeling, um, having despair, take absolute action on this Earth Day 
uh, to make the world a better place because I think its survival is very much up in the air right now for a bunch of different reasons. So it's up to us to pay attention to what's going on. Don't turn it off, learn about it, learn what some of the alternatives are. And my only little the plug is we're working more and more with our neighbors across the uh, state boundary to save Sharon Hospital. So anyway, Millerton, tomorrow there's an Earth Fair um, 2020. They have what's called Northeast Climate Smart Community, Millerton. And a lot of us there, I mean, more power to Millerton. They're doing their thing. And this, you know, grassroots power has all been the strength of this country. So more power to Millerton. And they're, they're doing something downtown. Millerton on the green uh, from noon to five. So anyway, it's my plug for across the border. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon and Rebecca. That was fantastic. We're so grateful to everything that you are doing in this town. And, and there's more. But oh, I know there's so much more. I know. <laughs> Sorry that we have a limit. Oh, and, then, and my lead in was that we're here on our off the grid house which James Laporta upgraded. My kids came home. We've been off the grid since 85 with Johnny Wells system, a little bit funky, homemade, $4,000. Uh, but my kids came home with computers, big screen TV and said, how are we going to do this? James said, I've got some panels for you. So we upgraded again, probably 10 years ago. And so again, we have a battery system. So our chargers and including my electric bike is all run off the solar stuff. The farm irrigation is run off the solar stuff. So it's, it's been a great system for us. And we had school kids come from CCS. So I said, this is how much it costs. This is, you know, the life cycle cost and we save all this money, you know, blah, 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 $20,000 20, over the cost of the system. So anyway, thanks to James and it's working well, got us into the 21st century uh, on the solar stuff. And our panels that we had from 85, we're still putting out some power. It wasn't as powerful as James's were, but anyway, it works, it happens. And again, it makes you a little more independent. That is so cool. Um, I will also just do a plug for passive solar, um, which um, my parents built a passive solar house in, they designed it in the seventies and then built it in the late eighties. And that also is helpful um, in reducing costs. So anyway, more on this from James Laporta. Thank you so much, James, in advance for teaching us about solar. Yeah, thanks. I can tell Gordon's very enthusiastic about it, as we all should be, right? Absolutely. That's great. Um, yeah, so uh, briefly, just trying to, you know, I, I obviously have a solar company and I do a lot of uh, going out and looking at various houses and doing site visits and, and explaining a lot about solar. So in brief, if it's helpful, I'll just do a little solar 101 where basically the sunshine comes down, hits a panel, the panel makes DC power. That power goes through a, uh, uh, an inverter and then um, the inverter converts that over to usually 240 volt AC power. Uh, that power then uh, automatically syncs up with the grid and um, that's grid tied solar. It's kind of beautiful because the, uh, the inverter itself is the brains of the system. Um, the system makes as much power as it can all the time. If you're using the power, great. If not, it automatically goes back to the grid, can power your neighbor's house, you get credit for it. At the end of the month, you can also uh, take some of those uh, credits that, that maybe uh, you over, when you overproduced. If you need extra power, obviously the, the grid is there to draw from. Uh, there's just a simple on off switch. It's very, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, the nice thing is it's a very efficient way. So the system making as much power as it can all the time is a great use of those panels. Um, uh, a lot of people try to go off grid and in Gordon's case, many other cases, it's really kind of maybe the best option if you're a long ways from the grid. But when you go off grid, uh, you need batteries, you need a charge controller, um, that system itself, if the batteries are full, there's nowhere to put any extra power. So the, the panels are just sitting there waiting for something to do. So, um, so that's, that's, uh, an off grid system versus a grid tied system. Um, Another uh, point to touch on is a kilowatt hour. So, you know, people historically are more used to things like horsepower or, um, you know, different units of energy. But with a kilowatt hour, uh, a lot of people don't really equate that easily. Uh, your classic, you know, 100 watt light bulb is 100 watts. So if you have 10 of those, there's 1,000 watts or one kilowatt. 
if you had those 10 light bulbs on for an hour, that's one kilowatt hours worth of electricity. Uh, in the state of Connecticut, that equates to about 22 cents worth of electricity. Um, for another reference of energy, um, I think the most efficient human being in the planet, they have a, uh, the World Hour Record. And it's a classical bicycle event, which is convenient because they have watt meters on the bikes. And, and these guys put out almost 450 watts for an hour, but that's 10 cents worth of electricity. So energy is extremely inexpensive and consequently abused. And that's kind of um, where we're at with, actually, let me, I can, I think, do a screen share. Potentially, can you guys, let's see if I can uh, go to this. Can you guys see that chart? So, okay, yeah, so. Yes. So these are these are in terawatt hours. So that's a that's a trillion watts. So that's obviously a, a lot of light bulbs. But here's your global direct primary energy energy consumption. When I saw this chart, I was I was pretty alarmed. I mean, 1950 was not that long ago, and to have the explosion of usage, I mean, that's uh you know even with the industrial revolution revolution and stuff, this the amount of power that we're using as a society now is really pretty astronomical. Um, and you can see solar way up here at the top is about, I think it's roughly 3% of the global uh, energy consumption is produced by solar. So we've got a ways to go. Um, you know, they're currently even still building coal fire plants in China and things like this. So, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if that's a pessimistic chart, but um, <laughs> let's stop screen sharing so that we can focus on uh, some other brighter things. Um, batteries, obviously, that's kind of a buzzword these days. Everybody talks about batteries. Um, in my opinion, batteries are not going to save the world. We basically have too many people using way too much power. Um, batteries are a slick technology. They're coming a long ways. Um, but again, for a perspective, one of these Tesla power walls are common. Um, there's a lot of fancy lithium ion um, home house battery systems out there. They're roughly 10 kilowatt batteries. Uh, they cost about $8,000. That's uh, just the battery costs not installed. Um, they store $2.20 worth of electricity. So um, they don't tell you about that often when you call up Tesla to say, I want batteries. So, so it takes, you know, with our consumption patterns, it might, you, you might blow through that battery in six hours. And then if it's January and uh, you're watching your batteries get depleted, that could be uh, that could be a hard sell for uh, if if you're counting on that for your backup power. Um, having solar doesn't mean you should use more power. So I have a, a, quite a few stories where uh, so we'll design a system for somebody's annual consumption, and uh, so we look historically at the, what their electric bill was, and we'll figure out okay how many how many uh, panels uh, could offset that amount of power, and typically in New England we'll overproduce in the summertime and underproduce in the winter, but hopefully you balance out net zero at the end. Um, we'll put in solar sometimes in the spring and then the client sees the extra credit and they just get too excited and they decide that they have a special system and they go out and buy a hot tub. So next thing you know, I'll get the call in November saying, hey, I thought we were gonna net out and I'll have to ask, did you have any usage change? And sure enough, that's, that's part of the uh, scenario. So. Um, you know, that, that's a common thing that they think that, you know, solar can give you a free pass to kind of abuse the power. And um, I don't think we're gonna, we're, we're not gonna change the world that way. So, um, and obviously, you know, this is, I'm coming at this information because it's Earth Day. It's not Humanitarian Day. It's not Economic Development Day. So these aren't necessarily, this is one side of opinions that obviously should be taken into consideration. And I think, unfortunately, uh, the earth doesn't always have a seat at the table when big decisions are made. And consequently, we're in a position that, that you know, uh, it shouldn't just be an earth day. We ought to, we ought to have a lot more emphasis on this stuff. Um, last point, kind of focus on the big picture. So um, in my opinion, you know, people are asking me when I go, does it matter, you know, how often they use their toaster oven or something? And the big ticket items are your house and your car. 
you know, cars are, um, they're not efficient. I, and, and I'm to blame, right? I have a truck that gets, you know, 15 miles to the gallon or something. So um, because of where we live, it's hilly country where our, our vehicles are very heavy. It takes an enormous amount of energy to move those vehicles up and down hills, um, you know, gasoline, that, th there's a lot of energy in a gallon of gas and we just pump it and burn it. Um, that's, um, you know, there was a, a movement a while ago about, you know, plastic and, and uh, which, you know, people go out and replace their plastic straw with a bamboo one. And it's, we don't need to be, to buy more things in order to try to save the planet. What we need is to not buy things, not abuse the energy that, that, that we're gifted with and try to think of alternative ways like we've been discussing. Um, so that's, um, let's see. Oh, another quote that, that's probably not optimistic, but uh, it was a Greenpeace quote that stuck with me, not that I'm a huge fan of that, but uh, when the Exxon Valdez had that uh, catastrophe, the quote was, it wasn't the Exxon Valdez captains driving that caused the Alaskan oil spill, it was yours. And that really kind of, it was like, it's all our issues here that we need to address and, and kind of come to terms with um, what we're doing and, and how we can change it. But uh, at the bottom, bottom line, it's, uh, I think our lifestyles are really pretty exorbitant right now. So um, I was hoping to end on a more positive note, but there we go. <laughs> That's okay. Not your fault. This is, you're trying to bring solutions to the world. So this is fantastic. Thank you so much, James. Uh, we really appreciate all your amazing, helpful information. I just wanted to throw it out there to anyone who might have a question. Um, if you can't put it in the chat or whatever, um, maybe, uh, I don't know if you know how to like raise your hand using the reactions button. Um, but uh, if you can put your questions in the chat, by all means, please do. We have just a few minutes left and we would love to get any questions answered. Um, so feel free to throw something out there. I know we've had so many great ideas um, and there, I wanted to just mention also, there was an article in the Chronicle about composting recently by Mayor Ruben, who I think is here today. And um, I definitely wanna encourage everybody to do that. Like Gordon suggested that we should all do home composting. So whatever you can compost at home that you don't have to bring to the transfer station, that is terrific. Whatever old furniture you have that you could take apart and make into something else or hire your neighbor who's really handy to make into something else, that would be great. Um, you know, just all like if I, mean, I think we all already do this, but just trying to constantly be thinking about reduce, reuse, recycle, the famous trio that um, really can help us. So, um, okay, we have a question from Phyllis. Um, how many houses in Cornwall have solar? James, you might need to be able to answer that. And I'm going to send you a message to unmute. Okay, you're still not. Yeah, wait, hang on, try to unmute again. I'm guessing maybe 20 to 40. I don't know, let's see, I've done almost 300 installs. Uh, on average, we, we do about a thousand panels I'll put up in a year. Um, so, so there's an average install of about you know, 30 panels or whatever that is. Um, yeah, and that's just in Litchfield County, I'd say, um, you know, a lot, a lot of it, it's pretty spread out, but that's just obviously Litchfield Hill Solar. There's certainly other companies that have done quite a few installs as well. So, so that's um, great. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I actually wanted to sort of um, understand something more fully. I know Jeremy, you said that um, that there was an issue with the state of Connecticut not allowing people to uh, sell the excess solar, but then uh, the excess energy that was created. But then James, you mentioned that that maybe is possible. Um, I'm just gonna add Jeremy in here. You two maybe can just clarify that because I'm still not clear on that personally. Well, let me go very briefly. Jim knows, James knows much more about this than I do. Uh, but the, uh, there's two different things. One is uh, net metering and net metering allows you to produce solar on your uh, energy from your roof and sell it to the power company. 
But there are two big issues about that. There's a cap on how much you can sell to them. And there's uh, uh, a big question about how much you will get paid uh, for that electricity. How is, how is the price of solar gonna get set? Um, so that both of those put a limit on the um, uh, ability to, to sell the solar there. You can definitely do it up to a certain point, uh, but then uh, there are limits. The other thing that I was talking about is what's called virtual uh, uh, net, um, where, uh, uh, which is sometimes also called shared solar, where a group of people or institutions in the case of the town that I described, it's all the municipal buildings of that town, <clears throat> all have um, the ability to share, uh, produce where it's most effective to produce the solar and then share it among those uh, uh, various uh, buildings or users. Uh, and that's what uh, many states are doing, uh, but we, have we've had lots of legislation to do it here but the power companies have come in and said oh we have to have a pilot first the last pilot only allowed three uh exam pilots three examples and um as far as i know only one of them is actually in place although my information may be a little out of date however jim uh, james go ahead because you know much more about this than i do well, in terms of the residential, which is predominantly what we do, so that, that is um, net metering allows you to sell that power back to the company at the same rate to, to Eversource, but um, um, on an annual basis. So at the end of the year, if you have extra power, then they're not going to pay you very much money for that extra power. So, uh, but up until that point, it is a one-to-one -one correspondence as well. Uh, and just starting this year, they have limits to uh, they'll they'll do a look back period of the last five years of your usage and see what your highest usage was over those last five years. And, um, and that's a cap to how big of a system you could put on to compensate for the amount of power that you've used in the last five years on the, you know, the most annual usage that you've had. However, they have um, adders so if you tell them that you plan to have one or even two electric vehicles in the future or a heat pump, either ground source or air, so air source, they'll allow you to put quite a bit on there. So as a standard practice, you know, that's, it's, it, and it's um, very lenient, those adders. So you can actually put in a, a, a pretty decent sized system, uh, probably an extra 10 kilowatt system over what you've, you, what you've been consuming. Um, so there is for residential net metering, the state's policies are actually pretty good. However, I got a whole bunch of paperwork on my desk because because they don't make it easy for me to do all these. For, it's 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 become a larger aspect of my my work is is um, you know making that happen. But anyways, that's that's paperwork. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Yes. And we have some more questions also. Um, one from Kate Green. Um, James, could you talk about a new system which can be both off the grid with battery backup if needed and also to contribute to the grid most of the time? She wants to know, does that exist yet? Yeah. So those are hybrid systems. Uh, they do exist. There's a, another program that the state just um, um, endorsed for batteries. So there's a couple battery programs out there to help offset the financial aspect of the batteries. And they're, they're pretty interesting. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things about it is um, they will uh, tap the battery storage as needed. Um, so, uh, and that's what you're getting paid for is basically you're being a part of the overall solution of having, being able to um, uh, support the grid at its most critical time. So hot summer day, a lot of people are using AC. They'll actually automatically draw down your battery. If a storm's coming, they won't do it so that you have that reserve. Um, one of my uh, concerns is they do it regularly and those batteries only have a life. So you are, um, you are paying for that, you know, 
you're giving up some of your uh, features of that battery life cycle in order to make that happen. But that, I'm sure batteries like that will be a large part of our future. Um, as I say, they're still expensive. They're, they're a little clunky, the systems uh, with the labor, or not the labor, with the uh, supplies chain issues. It's, they're hard to come by at the moment for me. Um, I'm, I tend to, to avoid them if possible, especially for um, New England, because if, if we have an ice storm in the winter, they're not gonna help if you can't recharge them. And then uh, that's maybe when you really need that battery. So if you're gonna get a generator anyways, for the limited amount of times the batteries will be useful, that's, um, that's some of our concerns. Cool, okay, thanks for that. Um, we're just gonna go um, a few minutes more, like maybe 10 more minutes, just cause we have a few more questions. Um, and I just wanted to make sure they all get answered. Um, another question from Wendy Murphy is, has photovoltaic technology become more efficient over the years? And is there a limit to that efficiency? And what can we do to get the utility companies to support community or shared solar? Is there a model for a group of people to create such a shared system? Um, yeah, so panels these days are about 20% efficient. Um, when I started, they were probably you know, 16, 17%. Um, there is a limit that, well, not necessarily to the efficiency, but there's only a, roughly a thousand watts per square meter of energy in sunlight. So it's never, you're never going to have a panel that's, you know, this big, that's going to power your house. It's just not physically possible. So uh, the nice thing about it is you don't have to pay for the fuel. So as long as you have the roof space, it doesn't really matter. And the waste, the inefficiencies don't harm the environment. It's just, you know, a little heat that's, that would happen anyways with the sunlight. So um, the 20% efficient, it's been, it's kind of asymptotic. So they, they've been creeping up, but there's no leaps and bounds that have happened uh, that much. Um, it, it really will come down to how much, you know, how large of a square footage area do you need to, to, to meet your demands? Um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of that question? Um, it was, um, and what can we do to get the utility companies to support community or shared solar? Is there a model for a group of people to create such a shared system? Yeah, virtual net metering, super oversubscribed program. Um, we also had some applications in for that. Uh, the, the one that Jeremy talked about is, is one of the few that went through. Um, and I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, hopefully that the state will, will follow through with that. It's, um, the, the solar is a funny business. There's a lot of cooks in, in, in the kitchen with Eversource and, and it used to be also the Connecticut Green Bank. They used to have uh, some uh, and they're, they're still a, a player, but they, they kind of ran out of money for, um, for some of their programs. And then um, the Pura Public Utility Regulatory Agency. Um, so there, there's a, yeah, it's, it's not straightforward. Okay, we have one last question. Um, this is very specific. Um, Dan Van Doren would like to know, what is the cost to install enough panels and batteries to power a typical Cornwall house? If it's possible to give that kind of estimate, obviously it depends, but just if you have yeah. an estimate that you could give, thanks. So it's kind of fun because I started, uh, let's see, 2006, uh, doing some helping out with Ray first, my business partner, and then we started Litfield Hill Solar in 2009. And, um, and in the beginning, we were paying $8 a watt for solar panels. Um, now, actually, um, a year and a half ago, they were almost down to like 50 and 60 cents a watt, they came down. And now the price is going back up a little bit with uh, supply issues, but uh, it's, you know, they're, they're pushing 65 cents, 70 cents a watt. And those are for top tier, pretty good panels. So, um, but that being said, that's just the panels racking. You've got the inverter wires through the roof with the copper prices these days, labor, et cetera. Rough uh, average Connecticut installed price, not just for me, but everybody is, is right around $3 a watt for grid tied solar. Uh, it's going to be more than that for um, if you're uh, putting a ground mounted system in, you got to build the structure, trench back. Um, so a uh, typical house might use uh, nine, 10,000 watts. So uh, eight to 10,000 watt system, 25, 30 grand maybe. These are obviously very rough numbers. Please don't quote me on it. And then um, there's a 26% federal tax credit. So that comes off that 
uh, and that next year will drop down to 22% is slated. Um, and then the following year is that's supposed to expire, but they've been extending that those things. So, um, and I didn't do this as a, I'm very busy and I'm not looking for more like, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, this is not a plug to, to call us up. So um, <laughs> we know we didn't mean for you to feel yeah. like you were on yeah, yeah. stage, you no, know, not at all. Yeah. okay. I'm just yeah. gonna, <laughs> but thank you. That is incredibly helpful information. All of you, I'm going to just add in um, Gordon and Rebecca and Jeremy and Margaret. And I just want to thank everyone so much did. Oh, hang on. I'm Rebecca. You have your hand up, right? Gordon, you guys want to say something? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. And I, I think Dan, a lot depends on, on your consumption level too, because I mean, we heat with wood and so that cuts our consumption level. So we're, I think James, if I'm right, I think we have about 2000 Watts of, of system on, in, on our roof now. Um, and we do have a, a backup generator, uh, which you sort of need to have anyway. Um, That's all over it, the map. I've got yeah. uh, installed next month for a large house um, using utilizing geothermal, and that really takes it, it's going to be 144 panels to offset their electric consumption. It, yeah, and we and we have 10, so yeah. No big, yeah. I mean, so it's, the thing is that also, I mean, it's different. We don't have a dryer, we don't have a microwave, we don't have a toaster. Those those high energy things. Um, so which you really don't, I don't know. It's one of those things that you get used to, but you don't really need. Um, when you also get used to not having it. So that's also an idea for people. Always best to try to, you know, minimize your use first, no matter what you're doing, you know, that, mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, and, and so. By a close line. Yeah, 100, 144 panels on a house seems like a lot. I mean, again, I think it comes back to individual consumption and. Oh, second and making a in second well yeah we won't go <laughs> we'll go there but you know again to all the resources that are going into that compared to yeah. it sounds like that might be yeah. the case yeah but again um living uh I mean, when we first had our panel discussion jeremy had his park on inside the house because he was too far away from the wood stove i said well there you have it you know, he made an individual decision. He saved some wood, yeah. saved some fuel, saved the environment just by putting on putting on proper clothes. You yeah, know? I mean, I think I, making good individual choices while pushing for a systemic change is a nice little succinct way of that I would recommend um, looking at this whole issue. Definitely. Um, I just wanted to add in Susan Claw. Susie, I'm about to spotlight you. Get ready. <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much, Susan. You, Thank you. made I didn't this happen. My hair. I didn't plan to be spotlighted, but you know, my makeup artist failed to arrive. Um, but this was I great. Do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was great. And I, I was worried about the time because it suddenly I realized, you know, we realized at the library, the days are getting longer. People don't want to be inside at four o'clock and then we have the most beautiful day we've had in weeks. So, <laughs> so I ironic. do appreciate it. And I think we should end and all go outside and, you know, see the last cup. My God, it's light till seven o'clock. It's like a miracle that happens every year. <laughs> thank is. you, Shari, very much for handling the discussion so well. Thank you. Thank you yes. so much. Thanks so thank much, you. everyone, for being here and to our amazing panelists. And James, Cynthia Foote is curious about geothermal, so she might contact you just because you that mentioned geothermal. We went last to little note. Okay, uh, on that note, we're going to close fun. the program, but thank you so much, everyone, once again. Take care, all. Bye. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Thanks, Sharon.